Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today's story is, roommate replaces me while I'm out of state but offers to help me find a new place. I send her to dozens of apartments and she does indeed find me a new hellish residence. Could be a case of double backfired malicious compliance, uh, you be the judge. During university, I lived in a shared house with four to eight other students. It was a fun, chill group. We often partied together, cooked together, shared bills and chores easily, etc. I was loving it, having lived with a number of formal roommates in the past. I had been in this house about six months and planned to finish out my studies there, which would have been another year and a half. One roommate, Janice, actually held the lease and was kind of the house boss. That is, she organized cleaning, groceries, bills and whatnot, including mediating roommate drama extremely well. And as she was extremely kind and fair about it all, we were happy to have her in that role. For example, once there was a growing tension about the growing number of fruit flies and kitchen moths flying around. Tempers were getting a high about who was letting this pestilence grow, but Janice stepped in and solved the problem. In front of everybody, she emptied every single cupboard and drawer and opened every package of food until she found the rotting mango generating the flies and the larva infested cereal spawning those awful moths. Instead of being angry at the culprit, she kind of harangued us into forgiving him for the small price of him buying the house a bag of shrooms, stipulated at half an ounce per roommate. If Janice had one weakness, it was that she was extremely wealth conscious. She came from a poor background and longed for the trappings of money. This was mostly harmless, like sporting a fake watch and a fake accent in front of certain people, but less harmless was her sucking up to richer people. One day she started dreaming out loud about how cool it would be to get Kevin living in the house. His dad had a sick cottage we could maybe use, he was always buying booze etc. I saw her sometimes looking thoughtfully at the other roommates when she talked like this, like she was dreaming about who to cut. The problem for her was that we were such a cohesive group that there was nobody who wasn't pulling their weight as roommates, but I was in a weak position. At this time, my huge concern was that Janice knew I had a big field season coming up. I was studying desert ecology at the time, which meant leaving the province for a full four months in the summer. I made it totally clear to her that I was keeping my room. My rent was automatically sent to her every month. There was no way I could live anywhere else, as I'd be out of town and in that city you need to apply in person. I said several times clearly, keep my room free. Then it hit. I was literally putting on my shoes to leave for the summer when she awkwardly approached, saying, and I'll never forget her exact words. Hey Mike, my name. Is your room all set for Kevin? It didn't sound like you were coming back, so I told him he could have the room. She was shamefaced. I was floored. My mouth slowly opened. I turned the door handle and I left. The next day I called her from the bus. I knew that the deal was sealed. But knowing her, I knew that with a bit of flattery for her organizational abilities, I could get her to help me out. I also knew that she was ashamed of herself. I saw it on her face, and I had no desire to antagonize her. She answered with a quaver in her voice, asking how the bus ride was going, making some nervous chit-chat. I came right to the point and said something like, Holy SH, you'll never believe it. I totally forgot to line up a new place for the fall. Now I have no idea how I'm going to work it out. She was audibly relieved. She had been forgiven. She said, oh, that sucks. I can help though. I have lots of time. Just send me some ads and I'll check them out for you. I can vouch for you at the same time and put in your applications. Now for the malicious compliance. I took her at her word and then some. Every night I'd skim the apartment ads and copy any that were in my budget and in the neighborhood I wanted. Then I'd send Janice the links with a cheerful note. Thanks so much for checking these out. I hope we can find a place quickly. Hate to arrive back to city and be homeless. The implied threat here was that if she didn't find me a place, I'd tell everybody what she'd done making her look like an effing P. She fully picked up the threat. I heard from other friends that she was basically working a part-time job just to find me a room. Every day she'd head out with a list of places and talk me up to the landlords like she was campaigning to win me a senate seat. She exhausted her whole social network. She praised me to everybody she met, but after a few weeks of this and I think about 40 apartment viewings, nothing materialized. I fully intended to milk her offer for the whole summer, but I was starting to get the feeling that she thought her obligations were pretty much met. She had spent weeks publicly declaring how much she liked me and how cool I was, and showing everybody how hard she was working for my sake. I kept getting messages from other people like, wow, Janice is desperate to pimp you out. I figured I had nothing left to hold over her and that the jig was nearly up. I broadened my search a bit outside of the student ghetto and into the adjoining slum. Suddenly, success. For Janice, at least. I sent her to a house advertised as being for young professionals. There were two roommates, the owner, a social worker, and his friend, a woodcarver. Despite the pretentious ad, the rent was incredibly cheap and the neighborhood was an easy bike ride to campus. To be honest, it looked like a lot less fun than my past place, but well, I needed to wrap this up quick before I lost my agent. 
Janice wrote me. Looks fine. Your room is furnished. The guys are really into heavy metal, I think. They have a skull door knocker and a lot of weird flags in the basement. They're a bit old, maybe. 35, but seem nice. They said you can come. So I texted the guy and worked it out. We set a date, perfect for my schedule, and a rent, incredibly cheap. The ease of this transaction should have rung my warning bells. Little did I know, this transaction was Janice's own malicious compliance. I had asked her to look at this place and apply for me. She did indeed do that. In complying with my stated wishes, she plunged me into a nightmare. The summer passed. I got back to the city at about 11 o'clock one night and showed up to my new home. There was in fact a skull door knocker, one of those very corny sculptures that often feature dragons, skulls, mushrooms, and other bad A imagery. I looked forward to meeting the social worker, metalhead, dragon sculpture collector, who I imagine would be a lot more interesting than the awkward cactus professor I had been tenting with for the last months. I knocked. No answer. I rang. No answer. I smoked a cigarette and knocked and rang again. Nothing. I tried the door. It was open and the lights were on. I stepped in, loudly scuffing my feet, and kicked over a pile of beer cans. Two guys were sprawled out drunk on the floor lying in their own vomit. There were dozens of empties scattered everywhere. I nudge one guy and he lurches onto his back, hacks up a lung, and yells at the top of his voice, Mike! Mike, where were you, man? We were ready to party. You didn't drink your share and we got all effed up. F, we passed out. This was Cal, the landlord. The house reeked. He showed me the room. It was furnished. It had a dresser and a broken night table, but no bed. Luckily, I had a sleeping pad. He showed me the filthy bathroom. The toilet was fully black inside, a state I hadn't seen before and haven't seen since. Cal was fully drunk during this tour, slurring constantly and trailing off into nothing, lurching back and forth in the hall. The place obviously sucked, but I was game. I had lived in some SH holes already, and the rent was so low. But the guy? He honestly looked like a late-stage cancer patient. His eyes and skin were yellow, and he reeked. While we were talking lease terms, he passed out on my floor, and I had to drag him out by his feet. This was incredibly awkward. I had been awake and on the road for over 24 hours by this point. I was exhausted. I knew I was moving into a dump. What else could it be for $250 a month? But I did not know that I would be dragging my vomit-smeared landlord into the living room, blazing a trail through crushed empties and cigarette butts. I cursed that effing Janice. Had she known? I laid him on his side so he wouldn't puke and die. Then I figured I'd better move the other guy too, who was flat on his back and also covered in puke. As soon as I touched him, he screamed, howled in terror, and leapt away from me and across the room, crashing into the wall. I'm like, uh, hey, and he screams again, eyes flashing, cowering against the wall in abject fear, and then kind of comes back to himself. He stands up wavering a bit. Oh, hey man, you're Mike? Justin. Too bad we didn't get to party. Sorry for the yelling. I have bad anxiety and I think you woke me up out of a nightmare. Cal set you up in your room? Cool, cool. Well, anyway, I think I'll pass out. Really nice meeting you, man. Let's get a beer tomorrow, huh? Good night. He lay back down in the vomit on his side and instantly started snoring. Cal was snoring too. I went to bed. Scenes from the house. Cal asks me to party tonight. I agree. We go in the basement, which is five feet high and which is the designated party room. It's completely decorated with skull and wizard statues and nylon flags of various metal bands. They start to drink beer and play metal. They get effed up, then extremely effed up, and all this time the music is too loud to talk. Justin takes out a machete and starts hacking the ceiling. Cal rolling around the tiny burrow, tears streaming down his cheeks from laughing, and I think I'd better go. They're still drinking when I get up for a pee at 3am and are still partying in the morning when I leave for class. I wonder about their stamina. Drugs? Cal is an alcoholic. He tells me within the first two days, and he hates it. I point out that his eyes are kinda yellow. Liver? He doesn't know, but he's worried. Should he go to the doctor? I say yes and he does. You're a college guy, right? Biologist? You know this stuff. The next day. Results? His liver is inflamed and he needs to lay off the booze. Furthermore, he learned why he hadn't been able to breathe through his nose for the last few weeks. His sinuses had filled completely with blood and it had congealed. Thanks, man. Glad I went. Thumbs up. Screaming from the computer room. Terrified shrieks from Justin. Cautiously, I poke my head in. Everything okay? No, man. This is not okay at all. Justin visibly shivers. Look. He reloads this YouTube video of a ghost sighting. He shudders as he presses play. Reader, I beg you to watch that video. It's only a few seconds. He hits play and after two seconds a blue blob appears. I start to laugh but he howls. I see his face. His eyes are bugged. He is terrified of this gas station apparition. Have you ever seen a ghost, Mike? He's staring at me sweating, his eyes blazing. He is completely earnest. You know they're real, right? I say yeah, I guess they could be, and I notice that his thighs are visibly drenched from where he's been rubbing his sweating hands. His face, I swear to God, is pulsing between beet red and stark white every few seconds. I leave the room and Google, what are the signs of a crackhead? K 
Cal quit drinking. He can prove it. He has six new Xbox games, which will take up money and time which he would normally spend on booze. I don't think I've mentioned it till now, but neither of these guys had jobs, so they needed a lot of activities to fill out the day. When I get home that night, Cal is drunk. Justin really was a woodcarver. He shows me pictures on his phone of extremely ornate and beautiful sculptures, some with him standing proudly beside them. Years later, this memory is stuck with me strongly. What happened to him? The noise is getting a bit much. I can't study at home and can only sleep half the nights. These guys can really party. One memorable time, they were in the basement without food, drinking, yelling, and blaring music for over two days. By now, I'm sure they're on crack or meth or something. As I'm leaving home one morning at 7, a black Escalade, rare in this neighborhood, pulls up and drops off Cal. He's wearing a beautiful black suit and is stone cold sober. I start to greet him, where you been? But he gives his head a tiny shake and walks straight into the house. Cal and I struck up an unlikely friendship. Years later, I don't know how to explain it, but although we had nothing in common, we enjoyed each other's company. I didn't drink with him again after that first time. We started seeking each other's advice, small things at first, but eventually I was bringing him social and emotional problems. He actually was a licensed therapist and he was bouncing his own problems off of me. It turned out that he was a voracious reader and we had much the same taste and we ended up talking books for hours at a stretch. I'm getting extremely strung out. These guys are drunk and yelling all the time. You never know when music will start blasting out of the basement. It could be 4 a.m. Justin is there and gone and back again. You never know when he's home until he starts shrieking. He makes me extremely nervous. Although he's very well spoken, never slurs, I can't tell what's wrong with him. His pupils are sometimes enormous, sometimes tiny, never normal. His eyes are so fast, he has all these tics, and he involves me in so many incomprehensible conversations. I don't dare humor him, he notices it, but I also can't openly disagree too strongly or he starts breathing very hard and glancing bug-eyed all over the room. When I'm at home, I'm on edge, day and night. Thanksgiving. Cal invited me, seemed desperate that I come. I said yes, Justin was somewhere else. Cal and I started cooking early in the morning before the guests arrived. Gradually, he hints that there will only be two others there, his elderly parents. He's anxious to make a good impression and begs me not to mention the booze. When they arrive, he introduces me as his roommate, the biologist. His parents are very warm and friendly and seem happy to see Cal meeting new people. After they leave, he doesn't drink for over a week. In the mornings when I leave, I've started packing up my sleeping pad and sleeping bag and taking them with me. I call home about 6 and if there's music in the background, I sleep at the university. If they've already started, I know for certain that they'll be going all night. I found three places to sleep. A dusty area under the bottom landing of a concrete staircase. A metal storage cage full of old desks in a basement. The lock is broken and boldly the couch in the grad student lounge, where I sleep fully dressed as though I just accidentally nodded off. They got an old bootleg VHS of a corn concert from like 1996. Do I want to watch? I do actually want to watch. I was hugely into corn as a teenager. We go to the party basement, where I haven't been for a long time, and crack some beers, which I haven't done for a long time. Justin is a bit whiny. You never party with us, how come? Cal defends me. He needs to study a lot, and besides, he sometimes has a couple beers in the evening. I guess you just weren't around. To diffuse tension, I mentioned that I saw corn in 1999, the Family Values Tour, and Justin's eyes lock onto mine. Holy SH! On the floor? Yes. With Rob Zombie opening? No, it was his brother. Bagpipes? The stage had a telescoping tower that raised the corn guy and his bagpipes like 50 feet up. F! Cal cranks the volume on the TV. They are air drumming. They're pounding beers. Justin starts chopping the F out of the ceiling with his machete. I get the F out of there. Justin wonders why I don't ever bring any chicks over to party with them. Do I know some? Yes, I admit I know a few girls, but you know, they're studying all the time. A lie. I'm a bit antsy because he's kind of rocking back and forth, breathing really hard and sweating. He starts talking rapidly about all the chicks he used to F. He used to be such a baller, now they're all so stuck up. He shoots me a piercing look for 3 plus seconds and then gets back to glancing rapidly all over the room. Man, I don't know how I'm going to meet somebody again. How the F do you do it? He's been smoking this whole time, and I notice now that he's tapping the ash off constantly. His finger hits the cigarette once per second, but every move is completely identical to how he normally taps ash. He doesn't seem to notice what he's doing. Tap, 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 tap. After his question, the conversation lapses, and I leave him glancing around, eyes wide, ashing and sweating. Cal is making a serious effort to stop drinking. He's struggling and seems to be reaching out to me for help. I'm so much younger, I don't know anything about this. I tell him I can hang out some nights to take his mind off it. We're doing that anyway. But other than that, I don't know anything. Has he tried AA? He looks up the local and a few days later he goes to a meeting. A few days after that he comes home with a case of beer, yelling, Justin, woo, an effing ghost here, man. 
Two days and nights into a raging bender in the basement, I'm awoken by a godless shriek of horror. I start to turn over, but Justin's screaming and screaming and I wonder if he's been hurt. I start to get up to check, but then I hear Cal, groggy, obviously woken from the basement floor, asking what's wrong. I stay on my sleeping pad, but now I'm listening through the floor. The basement TV area is under me. Justin, his voice quavering, says, Look, look what I found under the couch. I hear Cal rumble over there and say, A cake knife? So what the F are you screaming about? Justin hisses. That's where Mike was sitting the other night. He brought it down. He thought we'd pass out and he'd F us up. Now I'm fully awake. Am I hearing this right? Adrenaline sours my brain. They start to talk it over. Cal is skeptical, but I think I hear him getting convinced. Holy SH. I put my pants on. They start whispering and I hear only snatches of the conversation. He would have. 2P. Sleeping now. Let's do it. They stop talking. I leap out of the bed, throw on my shirt and I'm out the door. After that, I was secretly homeless for three weeks. I slept where I could and kept my stuff in a locker. I already had a few clothes at school so I was able to pass. None of my friends knew. My home life had taken such a sudden turn that I hadn't told anybody that anything was amiss. I brushed off my new roommates. Older, not interesting. Nobody knew about Justin and Cal and now I couldn't bring myself to broach the topic. I had my gym pass and I had a laundry card. I kept clean. It took me three weeks to find a new room. When I had it secured, I went to Cal's to get the rest of my stuff. He was there. I told him I was sorry, but the commute was too long, so I'd been staying with a friend who lived much closer to the university, and now a room opened up and I was taking it. He said that sucked, he'd miss me, but he knew I had to do what it takes for my studies. He offered to give me a ride to the new place. I looked at him closely, but saw no hint that he remembered that awful night. I accepted. As we were driving there, I realized that the new place was actually significantly further from the university, and when we pulled up, I saw that Cal knew it too, that I had lied, that I wanted to leave. He sat for a moment looking at the steering wheel collecting himself. He said, well, good luck with the exams. Come by any time. I hope we can still hang out sometimes. He looked at me so sadly and I saw the hurt in his eyes. I never saw him again. Months later, it all came out. I was at a party at my old place, Janice's place. It was late, everybody had left, and it was just me and a few old roommates. Somebody said it was too bad I left. Kevin turned out to be a huge D who wouldn't even wash his own dishes, never mind contributing to the group dynamic. It all burst out of me. I started telling the whole story. From the first weird night, through my futile efforts at cleaning house, my bizarre relationship with Cal, my awe of Justin, the nights under staircases, everything. Janice was stricken. She admitted that she had been annoyed and had deliberately applied to a dirty, ugly house, but she had no idea. How could she? Despite her sincere remorse and attempts to heal our friendship, it never happened. We drifted apart. Thank you for watching.